Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Zhang Jie, and um, uh, or you can call me Beckett, and I'm from LinkedIn uh, Kafka team. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the producer performance tuning for Apache Kafka. Um, so uh, I have a pretty tight schedule, so I my dry run actually take uh, uh, I took uh, 50 minutes. So I I will try to finish it within the time. Um, so, okay, let's get started. So uh, today, if someone asks you a question, what is Apache Kafka? And I think the standard answer would be something like, Kafka is a high throughput, low latency, blah, 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 blah. However, uh, the high throughput and low latency is not you know, com coming out of the box. You just have to tune it to get the best performance. So performance tuning is very important. And another very important thing is that to understand that per performance tuning is a case-by-case -case process that's very largely based on the different data pattern and your performance objectives. And uh, uh, in today's talk, we will see uh, what does those mean. Okay, so here's uh, today's agenda for my talk. First, we're going to go through the goals of uh, producer performance tuning. And after that, I'm going to, uh, you know, dive a little, deep, a little bit deeper into the uh, internal implementation of Kafka Producer so we can have a better understanding when we're trying to tune it. Um, and uh, followed by that, I'm going to talk about the producer performance tuning, how we actually tune it. And I'm going to introduce the producer performance tool in open source, which is a very powerful tool for us to, uh, uh, to tune the producer performance. And uh, I'm also going to do some quantitative analysis uh, using the producer metrics. And uh, then we're going to have some exercise to play with a toy example. Um, and uh, after that, I'm going to introduce two real world examples that we tune the producer performance to get a, a very low latency even with, uh, uh, without sacrificing any data uh, guarantee. Um, okay. So, First, let's take a look at the goal of the producer performance tuning. So the goal is basically with a given data set, which means a, a certain data pattern, uh, we want to achieve the throughput and latency goal with guarantees of durability and ordering. So that's basically the data guarantee we want to um, uh, achieve, uh, and we don't want to sacrifice that. And uh, uh, for producer performance tuning, at least for today's talk, I'm going to focus on average producer performance. Uh, for uh, two reasons. First of all, the 99 percentile performance sometimes cannot be tuned. So, for example, if you have a broker, uh, you know, bounce, it's guaranteed that your your producer performance will be impacted. The 99 percentile. So you cannot tune that. Uh, so that's why we don't focus on that part. Um, and uh, another thing is that tuning the average performance also help with 99 percentile numbers. So the, the basic uh, uh, you know, principles are the same there. All right, so um, after that, let's take a look at uh, um, what is the implementation of Kafka Producer. So by Kafka Producer, I specifically mean this particular class that's in org Apache Kafka Producer dot Kafka Producer. Uh, and if you are using the old producer, uh, you probably want to upgrade because it's actually really, really old. Um, okay, so, and uh, uh, the benchmarks uh, we uh, run in this talk is using Kafka 010, uh, which has been released recently. So there are two uh, changes in Kafka 010 might, might have some performance impact. The first one is that uh, uh, it's KIP 31. So basically we no longer do broker side recompression uh, um, and that saves the time uh, to uh, you know, to produce an event and increase the performance. So previously we have to assign offset for the messages and uh, then recompress it. And in O10, we actually use the relative offset. So we no longer need to um, recompress the message. We just need to put the base offset in the outer wrapper. Um, and another change is that we introduced the timestamp field in O10. So now every message has a eight bytes uh, overhead, which is a timestamp. So this can potentially uh, uh, you know, impact the performance if your message size is small. Okay, and uh, um, with that, 
So let's take a look at the critical configurations, and we're going to touch on them uh, in the talks uh, later. So they're going to be, uh, I'm going to explain them uh, in more detail after that. So basically it's a batch size linger.ms, which is a, a configuration mentioned by our ATC colleague. Um, and the compression type, max in flight requests per connection, and X. So um, now let's take a look at uh, the actual uh, procedure or the flow when you actually send a message through a Kafka producer. So let's say a user come in and call uh, producer.send and it provides you a producer record. It won't send, uh, send the record to topic zero and the, the uh, value of that message is hello. And it also provides you a callback and it won't get the, uh, the callback will, will be filed after the message um, uh, finished either, either successfully or you know uh, failed. So the first step after this call is that we're going to serialize the message into a bunch of bytes and after that we're going to determine uh, which partition of the topic of this topic topic zero should this message go and that's called a partitioning. So both the serializer and the partitioner are pluggable. Um, and in this case, let's assume that uh, the topic, uh, the partitioner decides that this message is going to uh, partition zero of topic zero. And after that, in the producer, we actually have this uh, record accumulator which holds um, uh, a bunch of uh, batch queues. And each batch queue is corresponding to a particular partition. Uh, in this case, we're going to take a look at the batch queue of topic zero, partition zero. And we're going to take the last uh, batch out of it. And the, the, this batch is in a lighter color, which means it's a uh, the currently like active batch. And we're going to take this batch out. And inside this batch, we have a compressor and we have a buffer here. And we also have a callback list. So, um, and uh, after we take out this batch, the this user thread will actually um, you know, compress the message and then append this message into the end of the buffer here. Um, and also it will add as a callback into this callback list. After this, the entire producer dot send is done. So this call will return and the user thread can do something else. And then the, there's another sender thread, uh, which is the internal thread of the producer will come in and it will uh, basically pull batches from the batch queue. Uh, and uh, it will only pull at most one batch from each batch queue. And in this case, uh, the, let's say the record accumulator um, has uh, three uh, a, a batch queue here. And uh, the sender thread will basically pull the first three batches out of it. And uh, the way it pulls it is that it's going to group all the batches based on the leader broker. So in this case, uh, batch zero from, so it's actually color coded. So the batch zero is for, uh, from partition, uh, topic zero, partition zero, and the batch zero uh, row, uh, the orange one is from topic one, partition zero. And they happen to, uh, the leader of those two partitions happen to be on the same broker. So the sender thread will group them together uh, in the same request. And there's another request to sending to broker one as well. So after that, the sender thread will send the request to corresponding broker and then get the response back from the broker. Um, and uh, here, uh, if, if there's a configuration called max in-flight requests per connection, that's basically saying whether you want to do sending, you want to send a message using a pipelining way or not. If this setting is bigger than one, then the sender thread will uh, pipeline in the thread. So basically that means it's not going to wait for the previous response before it sends the next request. Um, and uh, okay, now the sender thread has already, let's assume the sender thread has already finished the previous uh, requests. It's going to take a look at uh, uh, the next uh, uh, batches from the batch queue. Okay, so in this case, uh, the sender thread will take those two batches out of the queue. The reason being is that a batch is ready uh, when one of the follow condition is true. So either the batch size is reached, means the batch is full, 
or you have a linger time which is reached. So you can think of those two settings as a size-based uh, batching and a time-based batching. So one of them is reached, then the batch is full, uh, then the batch is ready. Uh, and another situation, which is actually our current situation, is that if another batch to the same broker is ready, we're going to send all the batches to uh, the, whose leader is residing on that broker uh, in the same request, no matter whether that batch is full or not. And that's like a piggyback behavior. So in this case, although batch one is not full yet, but because uh, batch one of topic zero, but partition zero is not full yet, but partition, uh, batch one of uh, po topic uh, M, partition M, uh, is uh, uh, full, so is ready, and we're going to send the uh, entire thing out. So, um, and it will be uh, grouped into request two, and we're going to send it to broker zero. And after that, once the response of that request is received, we're going to fire the callback in the callback list in order. So it's guaranteed that the callback will be fired in order, in the appending order, basically. All right, so um, now we have already touched the uh, configurations we mentioned. So batch size, basically, it's a size-based batching. And usually, uh, you you know, you increase the batch size, uh, you have better compression ratio and you have higher throughput. However, you get a higher latency as well because the, it takes longer for uh, the batch to be filled up. Um, and also there's a linger MS that's essentially time-based batching, so it's very similar to the size-based batching. So larger linger MS get better batching and higher throughput and also higher latency. Uh, okay, and also compression type. We didn't mention that. Uh, so compression type is actually usually the dominant part of producer.send call. You remember the producer.send call actually compress the message. That's happening in the user thread. Um, and uh, the speed of different compression type differs so much. How much? You can take a look at this uh, uh, graph here. Notice that this uh, scale is actually, the axis scale is actually logged. So uh, gzip is actually one order of magnitude slower than uh, snappy and uh, lz4 um, but of course the price you pay is that you uh, get a worse uh, compression ratio if you use snappy and lz4 um, and uh, uh, another thing to notice is that because compression is in user thread so uh, adding more user thread can help with throughput if compression is very slow uh, another uh, configuration is X. So um, X basically defines the durability um, level for producing. When X equals to zero, that's like UDP, you send and forget. So there's no data guarantee at all. You have high throughput and you have a low latency because you don't wait for anything. Um, and if X equals to one, that means you're going to wait for the leader to respond. Uh, so that gives you a medium uh, throughput and medium latency, and the durability guarantees that the leader get the message. And you can also specify X to be equals minus one. So that means you're going to wait for all the in-sync replica to get the message before uh, the leader can send you back the response. So uh, you get the best durability guarantee, but you get the highest latency and the lowest throughput. Um, okay, we mentioned that before. So basically, uh, this means pipelining. And if you turn on pipelining, uh, it gives you better throughput. However, it may cause out of order delivery when retry occurs. And please also notice that excessive pipelining can actually cause the drop of throughput. The reason being is that first of all, you have a very tight while loop in the sender thread, and then you cause lock contention potentially. Another reason is that because the center thread is keeping running, so you have a very bad batching. So uh, the compression ratio might be, um, you know, very bad. So uh, because of this configuration is related to the data guarantee, so within today's talk, we're going to always set max in-flight request per connection to be one, so we don't have out-of-order delivery. Okay. With that, hopefully we understand how the producer actually works to send a message to a Kafka broker. So now let's take a look at uh, the, uh, uh, the, the experience we learned how to tune the producer performance. So um, 
we want to introduce this uh, useful producer performance tuning tool, which is producer performance class in uh, open source Kafka. So the example you can run here is like this. So what you can do is that you can specify the total number of records you want to send, and you can specify the record size, and you can also specify the topic here and the throughput, which means how many messages per second you want to send, um, and the other producer properties here. So here we set the bootstrap server to be localhost, and we set the max in-flight requests per connection to be one batch size to be 100K, um, compression type is LZ4. So there are a bunch of things uh, you can set here. Uh, and with Kafka 3554, we actually uh, improved this producer performance tool uh, even further. So we added two more configurations here, or two options here. The first one is the number of threads. So basically now you can say how many user thread I want to use to send the messages. Um, and uh, uh, that actually allows you to actually simulate your actual use case because usually you might have more than one user thread to send the messages. And another uh, option we add is a value bound. So what does value bound mean? Value bound is useful when you send compressed messages. So we're going to use a, ran a range of integer to uh, simulate uh, the, the payload you, your, of your message. So different randomness of that payload gives different compression ratio. So you can, you can tune this value to make it the messages you send out to be uh, close, to, uh, to make the compression ratio of the message here to be close to your actual case. So uh, you get a better uh, idea about what will happen in the real world. Um, and beyond that, the uh, improved producer performance tool also prints out some internal metrics of the producer to help you to, to tune the producer performance. And uh, these are the uh, metrics it will emit. Um, and we're going to cover most of them uh, later. And uh, I want to just talk about the first one. So the first one is called select rate. That basically means uh, the iteration of uh, um, the sender thread running. So the sender thread wake up and check and pulls the messages out of queue and, uh, and sends it. So how many iterations are there uh, per second? That's the select rate. Okay, uh, and it's worth mentioning that uh, these metrics, it takes some time for those metrics to become stable if you run this producer performance tool. Uh, so usually it's uh, about one minute. So if you run it more than one minute, it should be fine. Uh, okay, so let's do some quantitative analysis using those metrics we just mentioned here. So let's take a look at this example here. Uh, so basically I uh, run this producer performance tool against a topic with four partitions and using only one uh, user thread and max in flight request equals to one. Uh, value bound equals to 50,000. And this is the number I get. So let's, see, uh, let's take a look at uh, these numbers and see uh, what we can do here. So uh, the first uh, formula I want to introduce is that uh, how would you calculate the throughput average here? So the throughput average is actually calculated by uh, this formula. So you can multiply by uh, multiply the request rate by the request size and divide it by the uh, compression uh, uh, compression rate. So here with that uh, formula we get uh, and and with the printed uh, metrics we get uh, um, you know we should be able to send uh, 10.22 megabytes per second. That is pretty close to the actual result. It's 9.96 uh, megabyte per second. And the gap is actually due to the request overhead. Okay, and the second formula we want to introduce is that uh, um, the request size. So the request size is actually determined by the record uh, per request average multiplied by the record size. So in our case, if we take a look at these uh, numbers here, uh, and we put those numbers into this formula, uh, we get this result. So basically the request size should be uh, 4794 bytes plus request overhead. And the actual request size here is 5034 uh, bytes. So the request overhead here uh, depends on the number of topics and the partitions you send in that request. And it usually ranges from dozens of bytes to hundreds of bytes. 
Um, okay, so the third, the third uh, formula we introduce is uh, request rate upper limit. So it's good, it, it's always useful to understand that uh, how many requests I can actually send, theoretically I can send. Um, so this formula tells you, so basically you can use 1,000 divided by the request latency average. The 1,000 is basically one second means, because it contains 1,000 uh, millisecond. And uh, then you multiply it by the number of brokers. So in our case, the theoretical uh, request rate upper limit is 1813. Uh, requests per second, and uh, we're actually sending 1448 requests per second, so it's not too bad. Uh, and uh, also the gap is due to producer overhead, and uh, usually the larger um, request rate you have, the larger the gap would be. Okay, the last one would be the latency. So um, the latency uh, can be calculated by this formula. So we have this record queue time average. So the record queue time average is actually the batch queue time average. So uh, the, the total time uh, the batch sit in the accumulator, that's the record queue average. So basically the first message in that batch, um, you know, get uh, the entire, you know, queue time. And the last message in that batch probably have almost zero queue time. Um, obviously, it depends on how many message, uh, how many batches are sitting, uh, be, you know, uh, before this particular batch. But uh, roughly, you can calculate it in this way. So in our case, uh, we have this uh, 3.96 milliseconds, uh, and the actual uh, uh, latency here is uh, 4.19 milliseconds. So there are some overhead also in the producer. Um, and usually it's almost ne negligible or ignorable. Okay, so with that four uh, formulas uh, introduced, let's take a look at this uh, um, example we just put there and play with it. It's a pretty much a toy example. So um, I want to add two more information to before we actually tune the producer performance here. So I know the round trip time of this particular case is 1.55 milliseconds. And our Kafka cluster has five brokers. So, um, and the network bandwidth I have is one gigabit per second. And it's way more higher than, you know, the actual throughput I got. So obviously I can tune it. So then the question is how? Um, okay, we know that the round trip time is 1.55 milliseconds. So the request latency uh, is actually uh, not bad because it's 2.73 millisecond. Um, and uh, according to this formula, we know that the throughput would be request rate multiplied by request size and divided by compression average. Um, so, and we know the request rate uh, is uh, 1448 out of 1813, that, which is the best we can get. So it's not bad either. So the problem becomes, okay, our request size is too small. Uh, it's only 5K, so it's too small, and uh, that's probably is something that we want to tune. So there are a few ways that you can increase the request size. And uh, um, first of all, you can add more user threads. So you can fill in up the, uh, the request quicker, um, and you get a you know, bigger batch. And uh, another way is that you increase the number of partitions. Um, the reason being is that you remember we say that uh, for each request, you can only take at most one batch for each partition. So in our case, because we only have four partitions and we have five brokers, that means in, on each broker, there will be only one partition. So in each request, we will only contain one batch. That's why our request size is so close to the batch size average here. So if we add more partitions there, that means one request can contain more batches, so we get a bigger request. And the third way is that we want to increase batching, right? We want to make the batch bigger. So why do we tune, well, why not just tune the linger MS so we get more batching? Uh, okay, let's start with the third idea, which I put a question mark here for some reason. Um, okay, so here's what I do if I tune the linger MS. So let's take a look at the left side first. So if I tune the linger time to become, so by default linger time is zero. And if I tune the linger time to become 10 milliseconds, 
uh, I get a, a you know slightly better compression ratio. It's uh, from 0 0.68 to 0 0.66, uh, and uh, the batch size actually increased. Good, um, and if I you know, increase the linger time even bigger to be 20 milliseconds, I get a better batching, right? I get a like 300, uh, 30K batching. Uh, okay, the left side graph looks perfect. However, if I take a look at the right side, uh, it seems quite different from what we thought about. So the throughput actually dropped. This blue line in throughput, when I increase the, you know, the linger time, I have better batching, I have a bigger batch. Throughput dropped, and I increase the linger again. Throughput drop again, and the latency actually increases. Like we mentioned, you have a bigger batching, and you have uh, you know longer latency. Okay, so tuning linger time uh, seems doesn't work. Why is the case? Okay, compression ratio here actually did not improve much. You see, it's only improved a little bit, um, but still it's an improvement, right? So why it becomes worse? It turns out that uh, um, turning, you know, bumping up the batch size is not at no cost. So here's something interesting. Uh, here's what uh, here's what this uh, graph means. This graph means that I bump the batch size from 16k to 32k to 64k, 28k until to 56k. Every time I bump the batch, um, I, do, I I basically um, Put the the the, the time the or, or the the, the uh, yeah the time of the previous one uh, here I dotted here so basically 32 is twice as uh, 16 so it's two 64 is twice as 32 so it's also two and this uh, this uh, like gray or uh, this uh, red line is actually uh, the batch size increase rate so it's always multiplied by two however the time takes to fill in that batch when I bump the batch size to be doubled the time to fill in that batch actually got tripled so it takes longer uh, you know so, so the time actually takes longer to to fill in a bigger batch and it's longer than we expected and this is for gzip so out of curiosity um, I ran the actual uh, you know setting using the producer performance tool and it gives me a very similar result here. So basically, the if you bump up the batch size, it takes even longer than we expected to fill in uh, to fill up the batch. Okay, so how about the other compression types? It turns out it's uh, similar. So bumping up the batch size seems not free, and it can cause performance issue, which is very non-intuitive. Okay, that, but that basically is why uh, we saw the throughput drop in that case, because it takes even longer to fill in this batch. And uh, we didn't gain much from the uh, compression ratio gain. So when to increase batching? So it only makes sense to increase batch when we you know, uh, have a very good compression gain if we uh, increase the batch size. Uh, and that gain has to be bigger than the compression speed loss, as we just saw. And also, uh, it has to be the case that bottleneck is not in the user thread. If the bottleneck is in the, in the user thread, then it might not be the, um, the ideal case that you want to have more batching. Okay, so it turns out the third option is not a good way to go. Then let's try to increase the number of user thread. And uh, uh, so here's what I do. So previously we, o we only have one thread and now we have two. And I bump it to four and 10. So as you can see, when I bump the, uh, the thread number to two, uh, the throughput increased to about 15 megabytes. And when I bump it up to four, it doesn't change much. But when I bump it up to 10, it's actually dropped again. And the latency actually soared. So why is the case? It's because log contention and batches are piling. So log contention, you remember we only have four partitions, and now we have 10 threads to appending messages to those four partitions. And for every append, you have to lock the, the batch queue and put the message into that batch. So now you have 10 threads plus the sender thread contending that four queue locking. So that's pretty bad. So now let's 
if if we understand that, then then the probably the the way to go is that we increase the number of partitions, and here's what we do. So after increase the number of partitions to sixteen, the dot line is basically the uh, the 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 number from the sixteen partition case, and we can see it's much higher than the uh, solid line here. So that's throughput, and the latency is much lower. But it still seems to be piling up. The latency is not still is still not low. It's uh, close to 200. Um, okay, Let, let's tweak the batch size. Although we said the batch size is not a a, a good thing uh, to tweak if you want to tweak throughput. But if we want to solve latency, it turns out that's a good way to go. So if we increase the batch size to be 800k. Although in the real case, it's not going to reach 800K. It's just, you know, have, you have better batching. And uh, we can see the latency actually dropped uh, to 20 milliseconds on average. And the throughput also dropped a little bit because of the reason we mentioned before. Um, and it's also, you know, counterintuitive. Because usually we say you have a, you know, bigger batch, uh, you have, a, you know, long, higher latency, right? Uh, but however, by increasing the batch size here, we can actually can improve the latency by preventing the batteries from piling up. So you always send all the messages uh, currently in the queue in the same batch. So there's no uh, multiple batteries that has to wait in the queue until the next iteration to send it. Okay, so what if we want to improve the latency and the throughput at the same time? Uh, it turns out that the best way to go is still to increase the number of partitions here. So once we increase the number of partition to, 20, uh, to 32 here, we can see the throughput goes to 41 megabyte per second. And uh, the latency also dropped quite a bit from 200, which is the uh, latency before. Um, okay, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's what we basically do for, um, let, let, let's just finish this uh, uh, play with a toy example here. So uh, as a very, uh, uh, a brief uh, summary. So usually you want to find out the bottleneck and you want to ask your question, where's the bottleneck? Um, and here's a way you determine where's the bottleneck. If, if you want to see if the bottleneck is in the, in the user thread, you just bump up the number of threads and see if throughput goes up. And when you do that, please pay attention to the lock contention. Uh, and if you want to see if the bottleneck is in the center thread or not, you can take a look at whether the throughput is way lower than the network bandwidth, or it is, uh, uh, you know, the, rec the record queue time average is large, or the batch size average is almost reaching the batch size. Um, also, you, if, if you want to know whether the bottleneck is a broker, the best way to look at it is that the request latency. Is the request latency, latency very large or not? If it's very large, that means the broker handles the, the request pretty slow. Okay, so with that, uh, we basically have already uh, graduated from uh, the, uh, the uh, producer, Kafka producer 101 here. Now let's take a look at some real world example. Okay, so uh, in many cases, we actually want to have uh, this durability guarantee. So which means we want to send the uh, message with x equals to minus one. We don't want to uh, you know, uh, sacrifice our durability. So in this case, what happens is that the total time of a request on the broker side would take these six steps or six uh, parts of the time. So first, you, the producer have to flush out all the bytes to the network, and that's one. And after that, uh, the producer request, when it reaches the broker side, it will go into the, uh, the request queue, and it will have a queue time, that's two. And after that, the broker will pull out the producer request and append it to its local log, and that's called local time. That's time three. And then we need to wait for the replication to finish. Remember, x equals to minus one means all the in-sync replica need to get to the data. So we need to wait for the follower, which is broker one, to get to the data. That's time four. And then we're going to uh, put the producer response into the response queue, and there's a queue time also. That's five, and then we flush out the bytes of the producer response, and that's time six. So the total time of a, a producer request uh, latency basically consists of the, the, five, uh, the six portions here. And it turns out 
the biggest difference between x equals to minus one and x equals to one is that we have to wait for the replication to finish. And this turns out to be a very big overhead. And uh, how can we reduce the replication um, latency in this case? So it's good to understand how Kafka do the replication uh, in, the, in, the, in a zoom in way. So uh, Kafka basically uh, does replication in the following way. So the follower will send the fetch request to the leader to get the data back. So in this case, broker one will send a fetch request fetching from partition zero, one, and two. Um, and let's assume uh, at that point, at this point, the broker zero has already appended the uh, data here for partition zero to its local log. And then broker one send a fetch request here. Um, after that, the uh, broker zero would uh, return the data for partition zero to broker one. And then uh, the broker one will uh, append the data to its own local log and, send, and uh, uh, let's say after that, broker zero will append it partition one, partition two's data to its local log. Um, and then broker one send uh, the second fetch request. And in this case, because it's already fetched uh, uh, the data from partition zero, so it's going to increase its fetch offset from 100 to 105. And at that point, the broker, the leader broker, will increase its high watermark. So the high watermark is basically the way the broker uses to track where are the in-sync replicas. And now it will increase its high watermark for partition zero to 105, which means all the followers now get message one, uh, before 105 already. And then, so as you can see, actually when we send back the, the data for partition zero, we do not increase the high order mark. We only increase the high order mark when the next fetch comes. So there's one fetch delay. Um, and then, um, you know, we return the data for partition one and partition two and broker one will append the data there. And broker one will then send another fetch that helps the uh, leader broker or broker zero to advance its high order mark. It will, until that point, the, uh, the broker zero will say, okay, now I know all the followers has got the the, the, all the messages from this producer request. Then I can send back the producer response. So as you can see, the entire procedure here uh, indicates the following formula here. So the total time, assuming broker one only has one replica fetcher thread. So the total time it takes to you know, replicate the entire message here or the entire produce request here is that the number of fetches you have multiplied by uh, the summary of uh, total, uh, the local time on the follower and the fetch request total time on the leader. So basically, um, it's going to take, you know, uh, very long to finish this replication, especially that the replication is not producer request aware, which means you can fetch part of the data from a producer request, and uh, you know the next fetch, it's not guaranteed you fetch the total data, you might fetch another part of it. So it takes multiple fetches to finish one replication. So how can we improve that? So it turns out that we can add more replica fetchers, and that would help. So that essentially becomes you divide the total number here by the number of replica fetchers. So you do parallel fetch, and each replica fetcher only fetches a distinct set of partitions. Uh, this is not a perfect solution for the following reasons. First of all, it has a diminishing effect. As you can see, uh, when I increase the number of uh, number, uh, replica fetcher to two, I reduce the replication time by half. If I increase it to, to you know three, I only reduce it from 50% to 33%, so it's diminishing. And also you have a scalability concern. So basically when you increase the number of replica fetchers here, um, the more replica fetchers you have, the more uh, thread you will have on a broker. And the number would be the number of cluster size minus one multiplied by the number of replica fetchers uh, per broker. So it's going to be very big. So then the question is that if we don't want to put the too big, uh, too, too many uh, replica fetchers there. How many replica fetchers there uh, should be? So um, here's the uh, three criteria we will put here. So first of all, what's your latency target? 
if your latency target is met, just don't increase the number of uh, replica fetcher anymore. And the second thing is that you can take a look at this replica fetch request remote time metric. So what does that mean? This is different from the remote time of produce request, which is replication time essentially. The remote time for fetch request basically means how long a fetch request uh, need to wait until the data arrive. So once this metric is greater than zero, that means your replica fetcher, your replica fetch request has been waiting on the broker for the data. So there, it doesn't make sense to bump up the number of replica fetcher anymore. Um, and also another way to look at it is that what is uh, partitions per replica fetcher um, is responsible for, basically. So if uh, each replica fetcher is only responsible for a very small number of partitions, it's probably good enough. It, you don't need to bump up the number anymore. Um, okay, so that's uh, what we do to tune the um, latency when you use x equals to minus one. And another example is that when uh, you have to produce across the ocean, so here's our setting. So basically we have a very long latency, a very long round trip time. So we have about 200 millisecond round trip time across ocean. Um, and we have a bandwidth about one gigabit per second. And uh, we set our batch size to be 800K. Linger time 30 seconds. It's, millis it's not milliseconds, it's seconds, sorry for typo. Um, and we have 64 partitions and we have eight user threads. And uh, uh, everything looks good here. We have a uh, you know, good number of partitions. We have big batch. We have big linger time. Um, however, the throughput we got was less than one megabyte per second. And what was the reason? So the reason is basically we didn't tune the TCP connection to uh, increase the receive and send buffer size. So the default, the open source Kafka default socket receive buffer bytes, uh, receive buffer size is 100K. And the default producer send buffer size is 128K. Uh, I guess it's not a matching up, so usually it's going to take the slow, a smaller one um, to, to send the message. Uh, in this case, the theoretical throughput we get with the default setting uh, would be 500K byte per second. And uh, um, according to um, the calculation, we sh we're supposed to have about 25 megabyte of uh, uh, the uh, receive and send buffer size in order to fully utilize that uh, one gigabit per second ethernet. So, and here's what we do. We basically bumped up the send and receive buffer size, and then we get this, uh, um, this basically curve here. Um, and this, this beginning dot is basically the 500K byte throughput. And when we increase the, uh, when we increase the uh, buffer size to be uh, four megabyte, it actually goes to 15 megabyte per second uh, throughput, and we increase a bit further, uh, so it turns out the max uh, throughput we get is at 20 megabyte per second, and uh, the uh, buffer size we get was uh, um, 10, meg uh, 10 megabyte per, uh, 10 megabyte receive and send buffer size, I think. So, yeah, and if you increase this a little further, um, it actually drops. Uh, mainly due to, I think, the, uh, uh, the, the network congestion, so you hit the exponential back off. Um, and uh, it's also worth mentioning that if you want to tune the, uh, uh, the buffer size, uh, you might want to tune the OS TCP buffer limit first. Otherwise, simply tuning the configuration on the producer and consumer uh, on, the, on the broker side won't work. Uh, okay, so... All right, I think I'm still within, okay, I finished within five, uh, f okay, 45 minutes. Still over around about a couple of minutes. Okay, I can take questions now, thanks. All right, yes, please. Okay, so I mentioned that a set to infinity is a bad idea because you are doing, oh, so the question is that um, uh, because all the tests we run today is actually using max uh, in-flight requests per connection equals to one. So the question is, uh, um, can we increase the number and what would we get? Uh, and what if we increase that number to be infinity? 
Uh, and uh, so first of all, increase that number to infinity is a uh, is a better a better ex experience. So basically, you have ex uh, excessive pipelining, and you end up with a lot of lock contention, and you end up with a very bad batching. So the throughput will be very bad. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, usually it's not. So yeah, yeah, right. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Oh. So I have a question about you know if we wanna implement like some of the job, if we wanna do some tuning, do I have to actually tuning the Kafka configurations? Uh, by Kafka configurations, you mean? This is a Kafka producer. The, uh, yeah, the most of the configurations here are the producer side of the configuration. Okay. So the user can tune it on their own. Okay. Yeah. So, but from some of the perspective, basically we have, uh, do, do we have any configurations for the Kafka message itself, or is it already controlled by the Kafka cluster? Uh, so Kafka cluster configuration, we didn't talk much about Kafka cluster configuration here because that's broker side configuration. Okay. Um, vast majority of the configuration we talked to today is on the client side. So because SAMSA is actually a client, I don't know whether SAMSA allows user to tune their, uh, the producer it uses for, for the job or not. If it uh, allows user to tune that, then you can specify those configurations for your job. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay.